I've been thinking this week about finally taking down my Easter decorations. Ever since my children were little, I had, um, you know, stuffed bunnies and baskets and different things I would put up at Easter time, and I just kept doing it after, after they moved out. So the small dilemma this week was take it down, keep it up, take it down, keep it up. Then I realized Easter is 50 days. I'm keeping them up just a little bit longer. So believe it or not, Easter is more than just one day. Easter is a whole season in the Christian year, and it runs from Easter sunrise to Pentecost, the day when the Holy Spirit fell upon those people gathered in worship. During the 40 days of Lent, we travel with Jesus to the cross, but during the 50 days of Easter, the church is formed and learns to live with a Savior who is in heaven, not on earth. During these 50 days, the Easter story helps shape the Easter people, the community of faith, or as we call it in 2024, the church, which of course is all of us. Now, usually during the season of Easter, the lectionary scriptures take us somewhere that we never go the rest of the year, which is to the book of Acts. We never read from the book of Acts during the whole rest of the year, but every Easter, the lectionary scriptures take us there. And for the seven Sundays in Easter, we open our Bibles <clears throat> to the book right after the Gospels, the book that explains the beginning of the early church. The book is called the Acts of the Apostles, meaning the acts of those who follow Christ. But it's really a book about the church and how the church began and how it grew. Today we're going to look at this book and use its message to talk about the church, even your church. So I want to start by just thinking about what comes to mind when I say the word church. Everyone has an image that pops up in their minds. I say church, something pops up. I mean either a building or maybe a special childhood church. Maybe it's a place you used to drive by, never go in. Maybe it's a feeling of community. Maybe that's what comes to mind when I say church. Maybe it's a place of bad experiences. Most people have an image of the church in their mind. When I used to teach new members classes, I always had the folks draw a picture of what the church means to them. These were folks who were coming in to join our church. And I, didn't, I don't know where I came up with the idea. It wasn't mine, but it really worked. And so my favorites down through the years were from people who didn't draw steeples and didn't draw stained glass windows, but instead shared an image that reminded them of the church. So for instance, one year a woman drew a picture, she loved gardening, and she drew a picture of a garden and talked about how the different flowers represented the different strengths and attributes of a church. And then a man drew a Rice Krispie treat and talked about how God was the marshmallow that held us all together. I loved that idea. Someone else drew one of those roadside construction signs with the big blinking electronic arrow that tells you which way to head in traffic. And he said, the church provides direction for our lives. So what would you draw as your image of the church? Whether it's good or bad, we all have an image of church in our minds. Now, sometimes, of course, it is bad. Unfortunately, a lot of harm has been done by the church. Sexual abuse and its cover-up, closing the doors to the LGBTQ community, or restricting the call of women to ministry in the church. The church has certainly done harm. Others in our world might say, well, I don't really need the church. I can worship God on a mountaintop. I can worship God in my living room. Who needs the church? And they would be right, and they would be wrong. Because I believe in spite of all its failures and sin, in spite of all its humanity and godliness, the church is simply the church, a marvelous place, a community of people who are bound together by one thing, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who brought them to life 
in the first place. We're going to sing this song pretty soon that says, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. And the spirit of God is how and why the church got here in the first place. So let's talk about that story. The book of Acts begins with Jesus ascending into heaven. After he dies and rises again, he spends 40 days showing himself to his followers, proving that he's alive. But then, just as he told them that he would do before, he said, I have to leave. I have to go back to heaven to be with God. He says, but when I leave, God will send another, the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. And so that's what happens on Pentecost. You remember the sound of the rushing wind and the tongues of fire. That happens in the second chapter of Acts, after Jesus' ascension. And we consider that the birthday, the beginning of the church. Just like any other gathering of the church, someone gets up to preach. Only surprise, surprise, it's Peter. You remember Peter, the one who denied knowing Jesus three times, felt guilty of sin afterwards. Well, it seems that Easter has made all the difference in his faith, in his life. And so it's Peter who gets up to preach on Pentecost. And he preaches, evidently, one heck of a sermon, because the Bible says after that sermon, 3,000 people were baptized. 3,000. <clears throat> so that was an amazing day when the church began to be. So our lesson that we read today picks up in the book of Acts right then, right after that sermon, right after all those baptisms. Just six little verses, that's all we read about the church and how it started. And I want to read them to you again. Those first Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe, meaning A-W-E, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food, here it is, with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. That's a pretty incredible image of the church. Praying, sharing meals, witnessing miracles, pulling their money into one big pot and using their resources to help others, worshiping God, and bringing more people to salvation. Day by day, the early church was formed. As one of my commentaries puts it, a well-rounded picture of the church, the marks of authentic embodiment of the spirit in the community's life, a canon for the measurement of the church's activity today. So these six little verses are kind of like a yardstick for us here at Epworth and for all churches everywhere to see where we fall, where we measure up, where we find ourselves serving as a community of faith. And so when I look at these verses, I just keep hearing certain words that, that happen again and again. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. All who believed were together and held all things in common. Day by day, they spent much time together, having the goodwill of the people. Day by day, the Lord added to their number. Together, in common, together, all the people together. If this first church was showing to us the true embodiment of the Holy Spirit, a well-rounded picture of the church, even a measurement by which to guide us in our life as a congregation, that I am sure that we are called to be a community of faith, a community together of faith. Now, lots of place, places want to be a community. Have you ever noticed that? People want you to join their thing, whether it's your golf club in the neighborhood or your, or your, um, your grandkids' sports club. Come be a part of us. We're having a great time. Join our community. 
There's restaurants. If you ever read a mission statement from a restaurant, there's restaurants that say, come be a part of us, celebrate with us, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's a reason that people are focusing on community because that's what folks are searching for right now out in the world. Loneliness is a problem in our culture. It's an epidemic. Folks are searching for a place, a home, a town, a feeling, a feeling of acceptance, love, even family. In the midst of these post-pandemic days and our country's divisions, sometimes all we want is a place that feels like home. And so many organizations are jumping on the bandwagon, try, trying to market what the world wants, but it's really what the church could offer, and sometimes does, a real sense of community. Jesus knew when he left that we would need this that we would need the kind of place, a family, a group of people who would help us to be Christians in the world, that we couldn't do it by ourselves. He knew it was too hard for us to do it on our own, and so he gave us, as a gift, the church. It was a gift, it was, it was a going away present from our Lord, so that even though he wasn't here in body, he could be among us in spirit. And he still is today. He's in this sanctuary loving us, shaping us, forming us, pushing us, making us, making you into a community of faith. Since this is not my congregation, I reached out to your administrator to get some ideas of how Epworth United Methodist Church operates as a community of faith. And I heard some wonderful things. I need to tell you, you don't always hear wonderful things about churches when you start asking how involved they are in the community. There are many churches who do not serve the community, who open their doors on Sunday morning for worship, close them, close them and they never open again until the following Sunday. Evidently, you have learned that being the community of faith is not just something you put in your name, it's something you do in your hearts. It's something you work at from the inside out. So let me tell you what I've learned about Epworth this week. Your church supports UCAN, which is a local agency that provides emergency help to folks through financial assistance to help folks pay rent or utility bills or doctor's bills, whatever is needed to keep everyone housed and well. You also support the Cockeysville Food Pantry, which of course is a critical need as folks far too often do not have enough money for groceries. You provide space and great volunteers to the Thrifty Penny, the thrift store located here on your grounds. All the proceeds from that store benefit and support missions throughout this community. Your church runs a daycare facility. That is a gift, friends, to the community and to families. In addition, you've participated in several mission trips. When I was here in January, the folks were just returning from the Dominican Republic. You've got one planned for July to go to Maine and work on a summer church camp there. You also are part of the Baltimore County Christian Work Camp, sending a crew every summer to do work there and help lots of people. On top of that, you send folks to help harvesting at First Fruits Farm, where 100% of what is picked and harvested goes to people who are hungry. In your building, you also host several recovery groups, and Girl Scouts. Then, as if that weren't enough, last Christmas you provided Christmas gifts and grocery cards for 20 children, representing 12 families from Padonia Elementary School right here in your neighborhood. You put together shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. And at Thanksgiving, you have volunteers who help with the Goodwill Thanksgiving Day dinner in Baltimore. I am tired just reading that list. Well done, Epworth. You see, you are not stuck only in here as the Church of Jesus Christ. You are out there. You are in your community, showing people, showing others what Christ would do. We are his hands and feet. There is no other plan except for us. We are the community of Christ. The Spirit is alive and well at Epworth, and that is your blessing, but that is also your challenge because our world is hurting. And people too often only receive hurt from the church 
or bad news or a message that says we don't want you. When we could rather do a wonderful job of showing love. So keep the message of love and share it with everyone, whether they return it or not, because since those early days of the Christian church, we've been shown how to be faithful in this world together, sharing in love together, always. Thanks be to God.